Hello and welcome to Wave Energy. So Wave Potential um, represents a third stream solar energy. So what that means is solar energy is absorbed by the land and the sea, making thermal gradients in the air that generate wind. And then these wind push up the surface of the water, building up the waves. And so this wind wave interaction is actually self-reinforcing. So the higher the wave sticks up, the more the wind can push up against it. And the more energy, which is solar energy from move different, um, different thermal gradients, the more wind that can push up against the, the wave. Um, so many of the waves that actually arrive on the coastline were generated in storms somewhere off the ocean across the ocean. So if we look at wave potential, um, there's about, you know, when we look at the wave potential that we could possibly harness, it's about two terawatts. It's a huge amount of energy. It's twice the world's energy production that could be harvested from the oceans. Not that it's economically feasible right now, but just what would be, um, what is available. Um, and again, the energy is greater towards the poles. This is the kilowatts of energy per meter of wavefront. It's just another way of looking at it. Again, kilowatts per meter of crest length. Again, versus the wave, same thing, but just the length of the, of the wave of the crest um, as it goes across. So it's a linear um, calculation. And you can see that again, we have a lot more energy potential um, as you get um, in colder regions. So when we look at wave energy, we're going to go through all the different wave energy um, technologies that are available, and there's a lot of them. So when we talked about tidal energy, again, by the, by the gravitational pull of the moon, here we have wave energy by wind and, and um, water interaction. And um, here we have, again, a lot of options, some that are on shore, some that are near the shore, and some that are going to be floating offshore. So our first kind of um, shoreline, onshore one, is um, basically a hydropower. So basically the wind is focused, it's tapered up a ramp. And as it comes, if the wind comes up and tapers up the wind, it falls over into a reservoir. And then it overtops this reservoir and then it exits the reservoir through a turbine back into the ocean doing a low head turbine. So it's basically hydropower, low head instead of high head. When we get through all the hydropower, this is gonna be a low head one. And so basically we, we are creating the gravitational potential and then it floods out through the turbine and then the next wave's gonna come in. Um, an oscillating water column, instead of the water actually moving the turbine, here we're gonna actually um, let air be the one that moves the turbine. So what it does is this turbine actually pushes the air in and as it pushes the air in, um, the forces is gonna, the wave's gonna, the wave is gonna come into this, this reservoir here, which is gonna push the air out of the reservoir. And then as the wave goes out, then there's a vacuum created. So then the air is gonna push back in. And this actually is able to use it when it's going in and out because of the wells turbine turns in the same direction. So it's turning this way as it comes in and then it's still turning this way because again, it goes, the air goes back in this way. And so the retreating air sucks wave into this oscillating water column. So here's another um, oscillating water column. And so again, here we have um, the oscillating water column where again, the air comes in, here's our air chamber. And again, it's gonna push it in. And um, here they have, and again, their turbine and the water column. And they've actually, some of these, they've actually enclosed them in like a turbine house because it's actually a little loud with the air going, it actually makes some noise. Um, but again, here's another um, example. We can also put them new, um, instead of having them on the shore as the wave comes in, you can actually put them near the shore. And here it's gonna be kind of, it can be either be floating or on a platform where um, again, the air water interface is what we're gonna do. So we're gonna let the air come up, or sorry, the water come up into it um, from, from floating. So the water comes up, pushes the air, and then as the water goes back down, um, the air is drawn in again. So it's the same idea, but it's basically moored in deeper waters, um, usually less than 20 meters. 
Here's again, another near shore where they've actually get to use that same, the butterfly valve where it goes in, it goes out, um, but they've actually um, have a little footbridge connecting to it. And so again, it's using, it's going up and down um, instead of being on the shore. Again, as we said, the wave comes in and the turbine air comes in and out and the turbine turns in the same direction as the air is um, forced out and pulled in. So we also have um, offshore, um, we have the um, McCabe water pump. And basically, these basically, you can think of it, have these floating platoons. And these platoons, so we have the McCabe water front and also the sea snake. There's a couple other kind of manufacturers that have been done. But basically, you have the center platoon structure and you have these, these um, these pontoons that hang out. And what happens is, as the wave goes up and down and up and down, it pushes these, um, these platoons back and forth and they get pushed up against. And then that forces the turbine in, out, in, out as it pushes in. So it's, it works as a hydraulic ram, okay? So the hydraulics coming in and out, in and out, and that is what turns the turbine. And again, here is the, um, the wave energy converter, but again, this we call it like the sea snake. And so again, this flexing motion of the different segments. So this one, instead of just having two platoons with the structure, it has many of them there. And again, so it has multiple hydraulic rams here, here, and here. And as these move up and down, it forces these rams to push up against each other and um, turn the turbine. Um, so this one's called a wave dragon. So instead of, again, so we've gone, we pushed air through, we've done a reservoir, we pushed over top on shore, we've done hydraulic rams. Now we're going to do similar to the tap chan where we actually have it using a reservoir and doing hydropower basically, but we're going to do this offshore. So what they have, and this is one of the first ones that was done um, back in the 90s. And so basically off the shore of Denmark, again, it was connected to a grid. And basically you have these two um, you have these two wave reflectors and these wave reflectors, what they do is they kind of drive the wave inside the reflectors to push it up and over top this reservoir to try to increase the height of the reservoir by pushing it up and over and top. And then it goes again, the, the air actually, or the, sorry, the water goes through the turbine. They actually do have these open air chambers, this pressurized system that actually can can as the as the weight of the water comes in, it can actually adjust um, the floating height um, so that you can get it depending on the wave height. Um, so again, it's going to be a low head kind of hydropower um, turbine powered by the water, and usually it's going to be um, moored at a depth um, around forty meters. So it's just going to be offshore. Um, challenges we want to again optimize that over topping. So we want all the wave power to come in and come over. And so again, those hydraulic responses to the lifting of these moors that we're trying to use to bring these in to keep them on top. Um, so we want to max, we want to minimize force and stress on these mooring and these deflectors. Um, but we also want to get as much water into it and develop an efficient turbine that can work with a low head and a variable because again it's coming in, coming out, coming in, cutting out to optimize power production. And again, the challenges have been reducing the construction, maintenance, and running costs of these systems. Um, this is kind of a fun one. Um, this is the duck energy. And so it, I, I guess it looks like a duck. I don't know if it looks like a duck, <laughs> but the duck moves in ways. And so it kind of goes like this. It's like a little duck and it has um, basically these buoyancies and these water bearings. And basically as the wave direction comes, that movement of the duck is gonna move those bearings, which is gonna, um, again, um, cause the, the, the turning it, it kind of, it's more of a hydraulic system, hydraulic ram system. Then, we have this system where they said, okay, let's just have the shaft that's actually, um, that we're kind of you know, using the turbine to turn a shaft, which then is, is connected to an electric coil. And so we're gonna turn the shaft here, or actually shaft is gonna be anchored to the sea floor. So the shaft's gonna stay still and the coils themselves are gonna be the things that move up and down, up and down, um, because they're gonna be sec um, secured to a buoy. And so it's doing the same thing, but basically the buoy moves up and down over the shaft and that creates this electricity. 
So again, here's this kind of concept of these, again, one to two miles offshore, and you could have several of these. And so again, here's this kind of point is where they call it the L10. And um, it focuses on what this is called, where the shaft stays still. It's called direct drive conversion. And so again, these are about three and a half meters tall. And so here's the, the power line, the tether, and here's the spar, the, the shaft, and the coils. And so basically you have this magnetic array on the interior of a floating um, surface um, facing spar. And then you have this pressurized ballast chambers. And then they have a halogen top, a light on top, so it can, it can be seen. Um, challenges is again, the efficiency of the flotation reaction to the wave. So they just don't want it to kind of bobble. They want it to really go up and down and up and down. Um, reducing the friction between the spar and the float, um, increasing the velocity of the float movement over the spar. And again, to because it's going up and down, up and down, you get these pulses of energy. And so they really wanna figure out how to kind of store and tamper these pulses that we're getting so that we can utilize the electricity and it doesn't damage any devices and the transformers. Um, so if we look at kind of wave energy advantages, Again, the potential um, is on the same scale as the global demand and demand, which means we have enough energy in the waves if we could economically, if we could be feasible, economically feasible to capture it, um, to meet the demand that we have. And also, the maximum availability is in our temperate zone. So, in in Europe, around the you know U.S. and the northern hemisphere and southern hemispheres where we have our concentration of economic activity and energy use. And so the fact that kind of up, north, up further north, um, we have a lot of energy and we also have a lot of economic activity in Europe and North America. Again, little to no land use or impact. Um, no, again, emissions, toxins, we're just moving water through, we're moving air through um, turbines. Um, the disadvantages, again, aesthetically, there is issues. Um, the, the air turbines, again, are noisy. They have one where they just kind of encapsulated that to help with the noise, sound buffer it a little bit. Um, again, navigation hazard for coastal marine traffic, um, as well as our own, um, we wanna make sure that the, um, uh, any, any wildlife doesn't get in, go through it. But again, these are just little low head systems. Um, large belt facilities may actually, if we have a lot of these and we're capturing this wave, how does that change the power of the wave that comes into um, the coastline? And how does that modify kind of the dynamics of the coastline? Again, possible interruption of fishing, recreation, and tourism. Again, transmission difficulty, costy from offshore devices, especially if you think of a large offshore windmill. Again, it's one device that's giving a lot of power. This is a lot of little advices. And so um, just because one device by itself isn't going to give the amount of power you would get from offshore wind, for example. And so we need to actually connect many of these devices because these are getting low head hydropower. Um, and so we need to connect many of these devices um, into a central facility to bring it on shore. So again, it's largely still in the development stage, but there are a lot of actors in this, in this area who are working to develop all of these different kinds of um, mechanisms for capturing the waves. Again, the potential. So the earth absorbs about um, 120, um, 100, 120,000 um, kilowatts of solar energy. So this is the amount that isn't reflected up, that's actually absorbed. About 1% of this is dissipated in the winds, so about 1200 terawatts. And then of this, about 5% goes into wave energy production. So again, the Wave Council says of the 60, about two of them we could capture if it was economically feasible. Um, but again, that's because some of it, not all 60 is we can capture, that's because some of it fights against itself. Some wave dissipates on its own, some's eaten up in shallow waters. So all of this chip, chip away at the amount that's actually accessible near, near land, you know, where we would even the offshore um, to about two terawatts. Um, so if we think about a two meter high wave, so a, a little over a six foot wave. Um, so again, when we're talking about that, we're talking about the trough to the crest comes up to down. Um, arise every 10 seconds, traveling a speed about three meters per second, making the waves about 30 meters apart. So each meter of wavefront has a volume of about 30 cubic meters. Um, again, the average height is about one meter above the trough for this sinus, um, sinusoidal shape. Um, so this creates this gravitational potential energy from the height of the trough. 
So if we were able to collect all of this energy, um, we would be collecting about 438 kilojoules every 10 seconds, or about 44 kilowatts of power for every meter of coastline. Um, so that sounds really good, but we also have to remember that compared to solar or wind at approximately um, two to 300 watts per meter squared, um, 200 for solar and 300 watts per meter squared for wind, sounds like a huge number, 44,000, but it's 44,000 watts per meter, not um, square meter, which makes a big difference <laughs> because we're thinking about meters of coastline versus you know a square meter. So it is a big number, but it's actually kind of a little bit of apples and oranges compared to wind and solar, because again, we're looking at how many meters of, of coastline near shore, offshore can we capture. All right, so that is wave energy. Um, we will discuss more kind of the advantages, disadvantages, and talk about all the different kinds of wave energy that's being developed today.